even to stand upon the same battlefield as the thousand suns, is to risk not just your mortal form, but also your very sanity and soul. They are unmatched sorcerers, manipulating the perilous energies of the warp to reorder fate, mutate living flesh, and steal the will and wits of friend and foe alike. To do battle with this infernal legion is to face the Empyrean unleashed. Their advance is heralded by magical firestorms and volley upon volley of warp-infused shells and bolts. As the battle lines close, shrieking herds of mutant Sangor, gibbering chaos spawn, flame-belching demon engines, and tank-sized bestial abominations surge forwards to hack and tear, throttle, immolate, and devour. Worse than the carnage the thousand suns wreak, however, worse even than their unholy twisting of reality itself, is the fear that however their enemies strive, those who battle them can never be sure of victory. Illusions and trickery are second nature to these diabolical champions of Zinch. Even those who believe the thousand suns bested may in truth be mere puppets, unknowingly serving the very foes they fight. Magnus the Red, the Crimson King of Sortiarius. The fate of the thousand suns is inextricably linked to their gene sire, the demon primarch Magnus the Red. In millennia lost to dust, he was a son of the emperor himself, a beacon of wisdom and power who served his master with the best of intentions. Now, Magnus is abhorrent, embittered, greater yet lesser than he was before as is the legion he leads. Magnus the Red is a towering demonic demigod whose might is augmented by the boundless gifts of Zinch. He is sorcery made flesh, a winged behemoth who commands the Empyrean at will whose mere presence breaks the fundamental bonds of reality and turns all to madness. Magnus's power is such that he can obliterate legions of foes with a word or a baleful glare. The warp-saturated blade he wields can take any form he wills, and with a single blow, can sunder a fortress gate or mighty war engine. Magnus's rune-etched armor is proof against even the most powerful attacks, be they physical or spiritual, and his flesh is so drenched in warp energy that he can never be truly slain. The demon Primarch's very presence twists reality into myriad fractured reflections and shatters the sanity of even the staunchest foes. He is a locus of unbridled change, a nexus of plots uncounted, the greatest servant of Zinch, and a walking repository of forbidden and sanity-blasting secrets. Yet he was not always thus. What records endure regarding Magnus 
and his path to damnation are sealed in vaults deep beneath the imperial palace, or else kept by the thousand suns themselves. These latter cannot be trusted, for no written word remains long in the hands of Zinch's servants without turning to conflicting lies. Yet, Primarch Gilliman, if pressed, might recall a tall and powerful brother, red of skin and hair, quick to smile and ever ready with learned counsel. He would recall also that Magnus's demeanor hit a troubled mind, for his legion, the Thousand Sons, were both gifted and cursed with a preponderance of psychic brethren. And so imperiled by this mutation and the suspicion of their brother legions. The emperor, it is said, forbade Magnus and his sons to employ their powers or to delve further into the sorcerer's abilities they courted. Magnus, certain in his righteous enlightenment pressed ahead. In doing so, he damned himself, his gene sons, and their adopted homeworld of Prospero. The scalds of the space wolves still tell how their legion, led by Primarch Lehman Russ himself, was sent to bring Magnus to heal. No records remain in the 41st millennium of the terrible conflict that followed. Yet its conclusion is beyond doubt. Russ's legion burned Prospero, shattered its crystal pyramids of learning, and would have crushed the betrayed and bewildered thousand suns. Yet in this moment, bleakest need, when his faith in his father the emperor had at last been broken beyond all redemption, Magnus offered himself up to Zinch in exchange for his legion salvation. So were the thousand sons and Magnus spirited away to Sortiarius, the planet of the sorcerers, located deep within the warp a place of insanity and unbridled change, but also of incalculable power. This would become the home world of the thousand suns for millennia to come. Yet their trials were far from over. For just as Magnus's body and mind had been irrevocably altered by his pact with the changer of the ways, so too had those of his gene sons. Ariman, architect of the rubric. Ariman is the greatest sorcerer of the thousand sons, barring only his demonic gene sire. All of his prodigious power he bends to a single cause, the salvation of his damned legion. It is an all too Zinchian irony that for all his sorcery, all his towering intellect and thousands of years of seeking, Ariman has thus far succeeded only in making matters worse. When the Thousand Sons first came to Sortiarius, they believed it to be a sanctuary. Immersed as they were amidst the tides of the Empyrean and free to practice their spellcraft as they wished, they soon discovered that it was indeed a place of damnation. Already prone to catastrophic physical mutation, 
a bane that the thousand suns had fearfully named the flesh change. They now found this trait accelerating. Few could doubt that, if this curse did not abate, the legion would soon be lost to madness and monstrosity. Yet Magnus, consumed by his own now limitless studies and brooding upon his need for vengeance, did nothing. Instead, it was Azek Ariman, the legion's former chief librarian, who took it upon himself to save his brothers. The spell that Ariman and his co-conspirators worked was called the rubric, and it was the final blow that cast the thousand suns into eternal damnation. Admittedly, it did arrest the flesh change for all time, but its cost was monstrous indeed. As punishment, Magnus cast out his once favored gene son, banishing him until he could complete the impossible task of comprehending the true nature of Zinj. Yet Ahriman was unrepentant. His efforts now became focused upon a single goal. He would restore his legion to their true former glory, not only undoing the terrible changes he had wrought upon them with his sorcery, but restoring them to a position of power, not known since before the emperor sent his wolves to lay them low. Since that time, Ahriman has blazed a trail of ruin across the stars. He gathers all those to him that he can use, be they thrall bands of rubrique, mutant zinch worshippers, or even masterless renegades for Ahriman to expend in the name of final exoneration. Believing with absolute conviction that it is within his gift to unpick the puzzle of restoring his brothers. The arch sorcerer balks at no deed, no matter how dark, cruel, or taboo. Providing it will aid him in his ultimate goal. To his foes, Ahriman's acts of violence and desecration seem random to the point of insanity. In truth, his schemes are nearly as sprawling as those of his demon Primarch. In battle, Ahriman wields the Black Staff, an abomination of a force stave that manifests in the warp as a burning black absence. Ahriman fashioned the staff himself. At its tip is the Stone of Hidden Truths, recovered from the runes of Tiska. Crowning the weapon are the severed horns of the demon prince Vadhakar the Annihilator, while its haft is built around the charred fragments of Ahriman's own Hekwa staff that burned on Prospero during the Space Wolves' invasion. Its blade, meanwhile, is forged from the desecrated remains of an ancient Eldari farseer's stave. Each new addition is rich in the powers of sorcery, heavy with fate, and capable of amplifying Ahriman's own sorcerous abilities still further. The Rubric of Ahriman 
Though the thousand suns had long been plagued by the horrors of mutation, the rubric of Ahriman was arguably the greatest single change inflicted upon them. For many of Magnus's gene suns, it was also the last. The spell's energies transformed the traitor legion from a brotherhood of warrior scholars into something altogether more grotesque and tragic. The power of the warp is ever in flux. When its influence is felt by the stuff of real space, it causes mutation and change. Unbound, unstable, this energy twists all it touches. Such changes take many forms, and can be beneficial for those who can harness them, at least while they remain under control. Many who embrace such empiric might are transformed over time so that they come to physically embody their own deepest obsessions, desires, or innermost secrets. Some believe the Thousand Suns were marked by Zinch long before their true damnation. Others whisper that it was the Legion's manifold pursuit of knowledge, their use of the euphemistically titled tutelary familiars, actually demonic entities, or some faucet of the sorceress energies they courted that led to their anarchic and widespread physical change. Whatever the truth, by the time they became the masters of the planet of sorcerers, even the thousand suns' own fluctuating records told a tale of mutation, degeneration, and madness. Once clean and powerful limbs became many hued tentacles. Hands that had formerly scribed learned treatises now grew vicious talons or became snapping pincers. Thousand Sons Battle Brothers sprouted profusions of staring eyes, fire hued wings with glass feathers, weird fanged maws that whispered sanity eroding secrets, and countless other obscene mutations. Some changes were powerful boons that made their recipients better warriors or more talented sorcerers. Yet even these brought an erosion of sanity and self, while the more disfiguring curses reduced once proud soldier scholars to gibbering wrecks of heaving flesh and bone. Few doubt that Ahriman and his co-conspirators saved their legion from a final descent into unspeakable horror. Yet the fate to which they consigned their brothers was, in many ways, infinitely worse. Ahriman's cabal performed their spell without Magnus' approval. The Crimson King's own accounts tell how their efforts were hidden from him behind concealing glamours of incredible potency, and how the cabal operated with supernatural stealth and secrecy. Still, they might not have escaped Magnus's notice, but that his attention at this time was consumed by schemes for vengeance and the desire for fresh and unfettered learning. 
No reliable records remain of the part which the Thousand Sons played in the events of the apocalyptic Horus heresy. But perhaps those events, too, helped to obfuscate Ahriman's intentions until it was too late for Magnus to stop him. The Ninefold Tomes tell of the rubric of Ahriman. They describe how the spell was so unbelievably powerful that it sent a bow wave and a dolorous howl rolling through the Empyrean into infinity. They describe a catastrophic superstorm of sorcery that engulfed Sortiarius, of an explosion of arresting and binding spellcraft so violent that it formed an impossible fixed point amidst the ever-changing madness of the warp. Writhing strands of fate were snatched into its grip like insects in amber and crushed into enforced stasis. Lightning strikes lashed down from Sortiarius' skies again and again, each strike blasting another of the thousand suns. At last, so the tomes say, Magnus ended the onslaught only by beseeching Zinch to intercede. By then, the damage was done. Every single thousand sun's warrior struck by the sorcerous bolts had been reduced to ensorcelled dust, sealed forever within their battle armor. Their souls, their minds, all had become mere geists, doomed to haunt their cursed war gear and lend it a near mindless semblance of life. Never again would they be slaves to change. Instead, they became the golem-like servants of their former librarians, who alone had been unharmed by the rubric and who had, instead, had their sorcerous abilities vastly enhanced. Thus was the Thousand Suns Legion transmogrified, cursed to the form it still wears unto this day. It is said that Magnus would have slain Ahriman and his conspirators, but such was not the will of Zinch. Instead, having banished his former chief librarian and favorite Jean's son, the Crimson King set about salvaging what he could of his legion. By necessity were the Thousand Sons now divided into two camps. The sorcerers retained their full sentience, Indeed, their minds and their cunning had been vastly enhanced by the rubric. Thus they became the Legion's commanders and Magnus's champions. The rest of the Legion, the rubric A, were now naught but dust and echoes, became the foot soldiers of the Thousand Sons. They could still follow direct orders, responding only to those who could utter their true names and thus command them. They became the walking weapons of their sorcerous masters, who in turn swore to work Magnus's will. Of course, more often than not, it was their own ambitions they served. Magnus could have been forgiven for fearing that his legion did not have long left to it. New space marines were created through the excision, 
culturing and implantation of gene seed. This nigh supernatural substance creates the unique organs which transform a mortal human into a space marine. In the rubrique, all was now dust, while the gene seed extracted from dead sorcerers seemed only to take root within recruits possessed of prodigious psychic talents. Such a small recruitment pool could never keep pace with the attrition of constant war. Contradiction and fabrication hide the truth of how this quandary was solved. But somehow, a thousand souls learned of the rituals of rebinding. Should a slain rubrique's armor be pieced back together, and should the correct, highly perilous rites be performed, the fallen warrior's dust and ghost would manifest again. Their war gear would be restored, their power undimmed. The thousand sun would be risen again to the cursed unlife he had so long endured. Thus, so long as a single sorcerer remained to scavenge fallen rubrique from lost battlefields, and say the right words, the Thousand Suns Legion would know the same damned immortality as did its luckless foot soldiers. Legions of Sortiarius Since the rubric, the Thousand Suns have become amongst the strangest and most eclectic of all the heretic Astartes forces. Their thrall bands comprise not only sorcerers and rubrique, but also all manner of infernal war engines, mutant slave soldiers, and unnatural entities. They fight to plunder knowledge, to twist fate, to exact vengeance for ancient wrongs, or sometimes for reasons so inexplicable and esoteric that they seem like madness. Yet there is always a plan in motion. The core of most Thousand Suns thrall bands remain the rubrique. For all their cursed nature, these chilling, silent warriors have many advantages in battle. For one thing, their obedience is absolute. Rubrique fight entirely without question, obeying he who invokes their true names and knowing nothing of fear hesitation, or even an instinct for self-preservation. Rubrique are tremendously resilient, not only psychologically, but also physically. Lacking any true corporeal form to be wounded, they can only be stopped by the ruinous dismemberment or wholesale destruction of the armor that houses their essence. Should this feat be achieved, the ensorcelled dust of the rubric marine is typically scattered and lost. Yet no matter how long that warrior may spend effectively dead, still they can be restored to their cursed unlife time and again. Horrific whispers persist that the rubric somehow afflicted even those thousand suns who inhabited the time stream before its casting. How such a sanity bending thing could be, none can say. Yet more than one thrall band 
has descended to plunder ancient battlefields from the days of imperial prehistory. Though they have lost any true sentience, war recalls to the rubrique the martial abilities they possessed in life. These remain undimmed and are now augmented by an array of fearsome sorcerous armaments provided by their masters. Excellent shots all, the rubrique lay down unceasing hails of fire from ensorcelled bolt guns and screaming soul reaper cannons, or engulf their foes in conflagrations of mutagenic fire that burn away not only the foes' bodies, but also their souls. The rubrique remain just as skilled at close quarters, fighting in eerie silence, but with all the speed and poise of living, breathing Adeptus Astartes. Only when the fires of battle die and the foe are no more do they settle back into a state of mindless torpor until their masters call upon them to act again. Indeed, even this lifeless state can work to the thousand sun's advantage. More than once, inert rubrique have been disguised as statues amidst the confusion of urban war zones, striking suddenly and with complete surprise at a word from their masters. During the raid on Zvanorth Void Docks, fifty rubrique were concealed within the airless interior spaces of a wrecked imperial bulk hauler. The rubrique drifted undetected through their enemy's patrol lines before reanimating and boarding the imperial warship that came to investigate their seemingly abandoned transport. Some sorcerers have even been known to seal rubrique inside Xenos tombs and other repositories of esoteric knowledge, ordering them to stand eternal guard over their arcane caches. Springing to life only should the incautious or acquisitive disturb them. The rubric marines and the elite scarab occult terminators form a resilient and powerful core to any thrall band. They are, however, far from the only assets that the lords of Sortiarius have at their disposal. Many sorcerers bulk out their thrall bands with numerous but eminently expendable hosts of slaves and servants. Beyond counting are the cults of zinch worshipping humans scattered throughout the Imperium. The desperate, the insane, the mutated, and the deviously ambitious, all offering worship to Zinch. The underbelly of the Imperium teems with petty magisters and their pitiful followers, all offering themselves body and soul to the changer of the ways, in hopes of seizing even an iota of power to change their powerless lives. Armed and hurled into battle, such chaos cults support Thousand Suns invasions with cunningly timed uprisings or pack out the holds of thrallband warships, ready to be expended like living ammunition once battle is joined. Herds of Zangor, too, provides the sorcerers with flesh and blood soldiery. 
These mutants are creatures of Zinch through and through, blessed with the Change God's mark and protected by sorcery and unnatural fate. Savage meldings of human, avian, and savage beasts, these creatures nonetheless wield ensorcelled weapons with remarkable skills. The shamans who lead them, meanwhile, possess sufficient cunning and innate magical power to act as lieutenants to the sorcerer lords of the Thousand Suns, or even to lead feral raiding bands in their own right. The Thousand Suns can also call upon war engines with rumbling engines and thundering guns. Many of the Legion's battle tanks still survive, though some have undergone mutations of their own, or else been taken as hosts for predatory demonic entities. More such manifestations of Zinch's will are bound into the brazen shells of the Legion's demon engines. These bestial machines are built by warpsmiths, skilled in the infernal arts, and whose services the Thousand Sons have either bartered for or secured by force, trickery, or hypnotic compulsion. Hunting pacts of tanks, armored transports, and rapacious demon engines are often employed to provide thrall bands with overwhelming firepower and increased maneuverability. Equally, the Thousand Sons are not above stealing such assets from other renegade warbands, or even from securing alliances with such forces. These arrangements are always temporary and invariably end badly for the sorcerer's unfortunate allies. The Ruling Cabals It is a strange contradiction that the chosen traitor legion of the Change Cod organizes itself with a rigid hierarchical system. Imposed by Magnus, in the wake of the rubric, this structure has been maintained by all of his gene sons, at least in appearance, through the bloody millennia since. Magnus the Red occupies the pinnacle of power on Sortiarius, both literally and figuratively. From his ensorcelled chambers atop the Tower of the Cyclops, the demon Primarch's single eye sees all, and his insidious will reaches out like Zinch's own to influence the plots and deeds of his cunning scions. Below Magnus are his most powerful lieutenants, known as the Rahadi, the Magister Templi who rule over the Legion's nine great cults. Always there are nine in this elite cabal, chosen sorcerer lords and demon princes whose empiric might and unnatural gifts surely indicate Zinch's favor. Of course, the changer of ways is ever fickle. When one of these warlords falls from grace, their fate is often a cautionary tale against unbridled ambition and treachery. While none but the hopelessly insane would think to scheme against Magnus himself, the jealous and rightly paranoid Rahadi have no wish to share power with their fellows. Thus, 
their ranks change often. All scheme constantly to reinforce their own positions while undermining those of their rivals, staging grand conquests, performing devastating rituals, and concocting labyrinthian plots to further their own agendas. Should one of these eldritch beings take to the battlefield, it will always be in aid of such schemes, and the hapless foes soon become nothing more than victims sacrificed to the Rahadi's ambitions. Bearing some of the most powerful arcane treasures in the galaxy, wielding empiric powers that make them the masters of mutation, illusion, and unbridled change, each Magister Templi is the equal of entire armies. Below the Rahadi, the main power structure of the Thousand Suns comprises cabals of sorcerers, infernal masters, and further, less highly favored demon princes. Just as the Legion itself is divided into nine great cults, so a coven of nine such champions lead each of these cults and direct its efforts in real space. This is not, of course, the totality of every sorcerer and infernal champion that leads the Thousand Sons to war. None save perhaps Magnus himself could give an accurate account of how many there are for the Legion has mustered its full strength only rarely in the last 10,000 years. Even then, with illusion and trickery being as natural to the Thousand Sun Sorcerers as it is breathing, none could be sure that all of Magnus's Gene Sons answered his call to war. Just as the Rahadi scheme constantly against one another, so the rest of the Thousand Suns champions strive constantly to advance their own power and positions. Those sorcerers charged with leading the Rubrique into battle aspire to muster the arcane lore and infernal influence to rise to the rank of exalted and command entire thrall bands. Those exalted sorcerers and infernal masters already leading such war bands to plot war constantly, seeking a path by which they might seize a position within their chosen cult's ruling cabal. Meanwhile, those who rule eye the mantles of the Rahadi jealously and lay their plans to assume the position of Magister Templi in their own right. The rubric of Ahriman left a scar upon the collective consciousness of the Thousand Sons, such that overt violence between champions is rare. Magnus will not suffer his scions to fritter their lives away over petty jealousies and punishes severely those he finds guilty of doing so. Besides this, there are too few thousand sons still truly living as it is. Few amongst their rank are willing to risk the future of their fraternity in such a crude fashion. On the other hand, the changer of the ways rewards cunning, manipulation, and trickery. His demons whisper into the minds of those thousand sons still sentient enough 
to hear them. They impart dark secrets, offer perilous packs, and promise might beyond compare for those willing to outmaneuver and subtly sacrifice their rivals. Between these internecine machinations and the myriad dangers of the battlefield, many thousand sons' champions secure the protection of the Sekhmet, formerly Magnus' own bodyguards. These elite thousand sons warriors fought in stylized Terminator armor and wielded ceremonial power blades based upon the ancient prospering Kopesh. They ritually etched passages of their legion's esoteric lore into the plates of their armor, seeing it as their duty to guard this precious knowledge. After the rubric, their essences were trapped forever within the arcane inscriptions they had wrought, absorbing their power and becoming all the more potent for it. Now, these Sekhmet guardians can be claimed by any thousand sun sorcerer, infernal master, or demon prince with sufficient lore to command them. They are utterly loyal once bound to service, and will fight with indefatigable ferocity to protect their ward against any and all peril. Below the ranks of the champions, the Thousand Sons and their allies proliferate anarchic profusion. Bands of Rubrique, herds of Zangor, and servile chaos cults fill the ranks alongside allied or enthralled renegade chaos space marine warbands. Magi of the Dark Mechanicum provide technological arcana or offer tribute of weapons and ammunitions from their surf worlds. Demonic entities are bound into service. Mortal psychers are taken as acolytes or offered up as sacrifice. There are few tools the Thousand Sons will not use to work their will, and few bargains they will not strike or later renege on in service of their goals. The Great Colts The nine great cults of the Thousand Sons are immensely powerful, if much fragmented bodies. Each offers worship to, and works the will of, a different aspect of the changer of the ways. In doing so, they further the overall cause of their legion, sometimes in competition with the other great cults, but always at the expense of their luckless foes. Each of the great cults specializes in a different facet of the Zinchian power, such as stolen knowledge, cunning scheming, or the manipulation of time itself. These foci color the way in which the cults make war, the kinds of strategies and tactics they employ, and even inform the grand plans they seek to put into motion across the galactic stage. In order to affect these plans, each cult maintains its own cabal of zinch-marked champions to direct its efforts. Its own ranks of Sekhmet and Rubrique, squadrons of war engines, packs of demon engines, 
and hosts of lesser Zinch worshippers, whose number vary greatly even from one conflict to the next. Moreover, each great cult is further divided in numerous thrall bands. And as the cults differ, so too do their thrall bands. While all are raiding forces at their core, their strength, composition, and favored methods of war vary depending upon the whims and influence of the sorcerers who lead them. Some fight entirely alone, their leaders bent upon some nefarious design or self-motivated quest in which great numbers would prove more a hindrance than a help. Forces of this sort often cross the galaxy by secret paths, opening coruscating warp portals or stealing through isolated spars of the Eldari webway, the better to strike swiftly and silently. At other times, multiple thrall bands from these same, more even different great cults gather their might to launch a great offensive or to defend some site precious to the Legion's designs. It takes a great event indeed to draw the great cults together and see them fight as one. Yet, when they do, the very stars tremble. The most recent example was Magnus's vengeful attack upon the Space Wolves' home world of Fenris. By that apocalyptic conflict's end, Fenris itself was scarred and tainted. The Space Wolves badly mauled while the nearby world of Midgardia was sacrificed wholesale in order to power an almighty ritual. By Magnus's will did these energies draw Sortiarius out of the warp's depths, allowing it to manifest in real space around the same star as long-lamented Prospero. This conflict marked the greatest victory for the Thousand Suns Legion in millennia. Yet it was but the first stage in Magnus's labyrinthian plot for revenge and vindication. Sortiarius, the planet of the sorcerers. There is nothing natural or true about the planet of the sorcerers. Nothing that is not in perpetual flux. Sortiarius is a demon world. It is an agglomeration of raw empiric energy bound escapably to the whims of the changer of the ways. The Thousand Suns have made this sanity-blasting realm their own and have plundered its dark secrets without mercy or restraint. Though Magnus has succeeded in translocating Sortiarius from the warp back into real space, it remains a wholly unnatural planet whose warped reality is anathema to natural life. The air swirls with kaleidoscopic storms of raw magic. Horizons glow with ominous and unnatural lights, or shimmer and resolve into new shapes before horrified onlookers' eyes. 
striated clouds the color of fire race across an ever-changing sky, forming leering demonic faces and staring eyes before shattering apart again in eruptions of blue and purple lightning. Squalls of raw empiric energy fall like rain upon bone mountains and plains of writhing flesh and flame. Their energy flows in mutating torrents back to the unnatural oceans which boil between the world's ever-shifting continents. The only fixed point in the geography of the strange world is Tiska, once the capital city of Prospero, its blasted remains were spirited away to Sortiarius along with the thousand suns themselves. Like the traitor legion who inhabited, this damned city has changed beyond recognition over the millennia where before there stood gleaming crystalline pyramids, now there rise megalithic structures of veined stone, whose flanks glow with baleful runes and dancing warp flame, and whose impossible geometries are encrusted with leering gargoyles. Where before there stood magnificent towers of marble and gold. Now there loom cloud-scraping obelisks, immense spars of tunneled-out bone and pupating flesh towers about which whirl flocks of demonic abominations. Legions are the mall-shapen edifices of Tiska, but they are all dwarfed by the innermost megalith, the Tower of the Cyclops. Looming ominously over the planet's surface, the highest levels contain Magnus's personal sanctum, and from the pinnacle comes a flood of iridescent light, cast by an entrapped tempest of glowing warp energy. This raging storm is enveloped by an orb of profane wards, and through the eye of the storm, Magnus watches the manifold paths of the past, present, and future. For thousands of years, Magnus has observed the material universe from his tower, biding his time in planning his master strokes of vengeance. Sortiarius serves the thousand suns as both a sanctum of study and experimentation, and also a staging ground for their endless wars. Within Tiska's towering structures are sprawling librariums, of plundered and forbidden knowledge. These lie side by side with alchemical laboratories wreathed in unnatural fumes and ringing with the screams of endlessly mutating experimental subjects. Labyrinthian corridors lead to sorcerers' lairs, scrying chambers, sacrificial altars, summoning circles, troves of sorcerous arcana, and unholy armories without number. All are employed by the great cults of the Thousand Suns in order to strengthen their many-faceted war machine. Further facilities lie within Tiska's fluid bounds. Their purpose to support Magnus's martial endeavors. The vast, nine-circled pit, known as the Abyssal Maw, 
in which demon engines and brazen battle tanks are fashioned, repaired, or bound into servitude. The glimmering spire of glass, the living crystal void docks that rotate constantly through ninefold astral alignments high above the tower of the Cyclops. The sanctums sacrilegious, which contain fluctuating warp portals that, with skill, foresight, and favorable fate, can be used to travel thousands of light years across the galaxy and bypass even the most formidable enemy defenses with entire thrall bands. Amongst the most potent of Sortiarius' assets are the obelisks of ruin. Though each is different in form and precise function, these empirogeometrical constructs are the source of the demon world's orbital defenses. These constitute an overlapping and incredibly intricate interweaving of spells that wreathe the planet from one pole to the other. It is said that Sortiarius knows the weaknesses of all who attempt to approach it in anger and delights in levering open the cracks in its enemy's defenses through twisted sorcery. Whether it is accurate to attribute such sentience to the demon world is questionable. It cannot be denied, however, that almost every attempted attack upon the Thousand Suns' unnatural homeworld has ended in disaster. Storms of writhing warp flame spring to life in the void, engulfing those foes who attempt to approach by stealth. Illusory glamours inveigle themselves into the minds of those who make a more overt approach, tricking them into firing on one another even as they seek to bombard the Sortiarian surface. Sensor networks fill with contradictory information or crackle madly as they are possessed by unholy data demons, even as hatches open to depressurize decks, warheads detonate within sealed magazines, and warp drives implode to hideous effect. Such are but a few of the unnatural fates that have claimed those who dare approach Sortiarius with harmful intent. Beyond the bounds of Tisca, Sortiarius is freakish and ever-shifting. Certain landmarks and regions are known to the Thousand Suns, from nomad peaks to the shimmering amorphic plains the forests of tentacles, the glass fire chasms, and the predatory caverns of transmogrification. However, the locations of these places are ever in flux, dictated not only by the movement of the planet's land masses, but also the phases of Sortiarius' star and newfound sister worlds, and the ebb and flow of warp energies across the world's surface. It is amidst these strange environs that the Zangor herds scratch in existence. They prey upon one another, and on the mewling chaos spawn that haunt the wilds, avoiding only the enormous mutilith vortex beasts that are Sortiarius's unnatural 
apex predators. The Tsangor labor to raise strange fluck cairns where the planet's sorcerous ley lines converge. Channeling Zinch's power through real space by erecting duplicate cairns in the wilds of other worlds. The longer these simulacra remain in place, the more mutating empiric energy bleeds through from Sortiarius, corrupting the natural landscapes before full-scale invasion. The Fall of Ultimus To do battle with the Thousand Suns is no simple or clean-cut matter. Duplicity, misdirection, the manipulation of fate, and the callous sacrifice of allies and enemies alike all play their parts in their intricate schemes. Worse, what looks to their foes to be the totality of the conflict may turn out to be but one strand of a far wider and more intricately woven web. Such was the case when Hasak Atali set his sights upon the bastion world of Ultimus and its hub fortress, Aquila Incursus. When Indominus Crusade Fleet Quintus pushed battle groups into the Mephisto sector, they reclaimed a valuable swathe of systems for the Imperium. In their wake, the battle groups left sturdy supply chains running through the bastion worlds of Ultimus and Vorsicon. Ultimus, in particular, was a seemingly impenetrable strongpoint. Ten regiments of Astra Militarum soldiery garrisoned its towering fortifications. Manipuls of the Skitarian occupied its subterranean bunker plexus. A maniple of the Legio Decimator Titans patrolled its irradiated deserts, and squadrons from Battlefleet Pacificus its orbital approaches. Despite, or indeed partly because of, all these defenses, Asak Atali resolved to conquer Ultimus in Zinch's name. His reasons were many faceted. Atali was a Rahadi Magister Templi of the Cult of Scheming, and he wished to prove his dominance, not to mention the might of his cult, by laying low an imperial world proclaimed impregnable. Moreover, Battlegroup Delphi of Crusade Fleet Quintus continued to prosecute an effective offensive through the Omnicon Reach, drawing on supplies funneled through Ultimus. Their efforts threatened the sorcerous sanctum that Atali maintained in that region upon the moon of Vigoria. The Magister Templi also sought a precious prize. He had learned from a demonic familiar that a precious magical relic, the Talisman of Glass, languished within a sealed inquisitorial vault on Ultimus. His rival Rahadi, Corscaris of the Cult of Magic, sought to seize this relic, and Atali had determined to secure it first. Atali's attack upon Ultimus began with misinformation centered around a world far away across the Mephisto sector. Employing duped mortal cult agents, he saw to it that an aspiring sorcerer within the cult of magic learned of an entirely fictitious demon sword. 
The lie went that this potent weapon lay entombed beneath the mountains of the world of Narthus, and was soon to be discovered by dig teams of the Adeptus Mechanicus. While his lies were seeping their way to the intended target, Atali made a pact with a demonic entity. This creature manifested before Hapfester, an exalted sorcerer of the cult of magic, who had recently fallen from the favor with his cult Rahadi, and would do anything to curry that favor with his displeased master. From the demon's whisperings, Hapfester learned of the so-called precious secret being hoarded by his acolyte. Predictably, he was quick to punish the aspiring sorcerer, and to pass on the information about the blade on Narthus to his Rahadi master. Believing that the fabled demon blade would lend him might in his planned attack on Ultimus, Corscaris launched an attack upon Narthus. His thrall bands were soon embroiled in a running battle with the Adeptus Mechanicus. While his Narthus gambit was developing, Atali set other plans in motion. He triggered cultist sleeper cells on several Imperial-held worlds along the star-spun way, the stable warp route connecting Ultimus to both Narthus and the Omricon Reach. He fed small thrall bands and carefully picked kill teams into the escalating conflict, fanning the flames of war and imperiling the star-spun way. At the same time, Atali himself met with the champions of several renegade bands of heretic Astartes within his sanctum on the moon of Egoria. There, he promised these rapacious pirates power and sorcerous rewards in return for their aid. They were to launch diversionary attacks against key task force from the battle group Delphi, their intent to draw in the battle group's reserves. The Imperial commanders would thus be left with no additional forces that could threaten Atali's sanctum, nor respond should Ultimus call for aid. Next, Atali had several of his sorcerer lieutenants send nightmares of disaster and defeat to poison the sleep of General Gresmond, Ultimus's commanding officer. Filled with nameless dread, seeing the flames of war burning hotter along the star-spun way, Gresmond resolved that he had to act. Atali's lieutenants stoked Gresman's growing panic with the skill of impresarios, ensuring his response was disproportionately heavy-handed. The general sent more than half his warships along the star-spun way, bearing three of his garrison regiments, most of his Skitari, and half the titans to form a decisive army of reconquest. It was not long before this force detected the distress calls emanating from Narthus. Compelled to aid the hard-pressed Adeptus Mechanicus explorators, they fell upon the cult of magic thrall bands attacking the planet. Thus were Corscaris's thrall bands mauled Atali, aided by his ally within the cult of prophecy, knew the precise moment to spring his trap. He unleashed demonic allies upon those same renegade warbands 
would pledge to aid him in the Amrakan Reach, offering his erstwhile allies up as sacrifices to the demons. Caught between their imperial foes and ravening demons, the piratical bands were slaughtered. In return for this offering, the Lord of Change, who led the demons, conjured up a short-lived warp storm that surrounded Narthus. It would burn out within nine weeks, but that would be long enough, for until it did, more than half of Ultimus' garrisons was trapped. Still, Atali was not done. He dispatched thrall bands of Tsangor to the agri worlds of Horgith and Kladak, and had them raise flux cairns in secret. So were the food stores destined for Ultimus infected with mutagenic magics. He swore a blood favor pact with a sorcerer of the cult of time, having them launch a raid against the planet Decimar. Atali's sworn allies used their temporal powers to cast Decimar a decade backwards along its own timeline. Everything that had happened upon that world for the last ten years was undone, and while it would happen again as fate intended, this sent ripples through time and space. Four of Ultimus's garrison regiments were Decimari, and now all four had not yet been raised. Thus, in an instant, they vanished from that world and all forgot they had ever been there. At last, Rahadi Hasak Atali launched his invasion of Ultimus with vast and terrible forces. Against them stood a handful of warships, a demi maniple of titans, and a meager three regiments of Astra Militarum. Of course, the Imperial forces fought as hard as they could, but riven by a mysterious plague of mutation spreading through their ranks, from tainted rations and horribly overmatched in martial might, they could never prevail. Atali claimed the talisman of glass from amongst Ultimus's blasted ruins, but he also protected his personal sanctum, undermined an entire battle group of Indominus Fleet Quintus, and crippled the military might of his most despised Rahadi rival. Meanwhile, the punishments and inquisitions as to how General Gresmond had come to leave a crucial redoubt world so woefully unprotected would rage on for years to come. This was fortunate, as Hasak Atali had several schemes already developing that would benefit greatly from that ongoing strife. <laughs>